Hi and welcome to this third episode in the series on healing and repair. In the first episode, we saw the general features of healing. In the second episode, we discussed healing of skin wounds. And in this third episode, we are going to discuss fracture healing or healing of bone fractures. Fracture healing resembles healing of skin wounds to some extent. Just like in skin wounds, Fracture healing is also classified into fracture healing through primary union and fracture healing through secondary union. Primary union happens when the ends of the fractures are approximated surgically, that is with the help of clamps or metal plates. Here the union takes place with the formation of medullary callus without formation of periosteal callus. Here the patient can be made mobile or ambulatory early but there is extensive bone necrosis and slow healing. Remember the bone necrosis is extensive and the healing is slow but still the patient can be made ambulatory or mobile very early. Secondary union is when plaster casts are applied. Here the process is arbitrarily divided into three headings the stage of procallus formation, the stage of osseous callus formation, and the stage of remodeling. We will discuss these stages in a little bit more detail. As I told you, the healing process is somewhat similar to the healing process of skin wound. So as in skin wound, the first thing happening is bleeding followed by blood clot and then there is local inflammatory response. The macrophages entering the site at this stage clear away necrosed bone fragments. Next, ingrowth of granulation tissue occurs from both periosteum and endosteum and this gives rise to the formation of a soft tissue callus and this callus joins both fractured ends but there is not much strength. The next stage is formation of oven bone callus and in this stage a callus composed of oven bone is formed. How? The cells of the inner layer of periosteum have osteogenic potential. They have the potential to transform into osteoblasts and lay down bone. These osteogenic cells lay down osteoid matrix and it undergoes calcification to form oven bone callus. This oven bone callus is arbitrarily divided into external, intermediate and internal procallus. Next comes the stage of osseous callus formation and in this stage the oven bone which is already formed is removed by incoming osteoclasts or they are cleared away by incoming osteoclasts and in that place proper lamellar bone is formed by osteoblasts invading the area. So the oven bone callus is removed and is replaced by lamellar bone. The third and final stage is the stage of remodeling. And in this stage, osteoblastic laying and osteoclastic removal takes place simultaneously, remodeling or shaping the bone structure. Usually, the external callus is removed Intermediate callus gives rise to cortex of the bone and the internal callus forms the marrow cavity. So that's the story of fracture healing coming to its complications. One of the complications is fibrous union 
which occurs when immobilization is not done properly. When the immobilization is not proper, instead of osseous or bony union, fibrous union takes place. Non-union results when there is some soft tissue interposed between fracture ends. And delayed union can occur from any usual cause of delayed wound healing. And that brings us to the factors which influence healing. Not just fracture healing, healing in general. Factors influencing healing. Factors delaying or speeding up healing. These factors can be broadly classified into systemic and local factors. The systemic factors include age. Healing is faster in young age and somewhat delayed in older age and this is due to poor blood supply as aging occurs. Another major factor is malnutrition. Deficiency of certain factors like protein, vitamin C, vitamin A or zinc delays wound healing. The healing is also delayed when there is defect in functioning of leukocytes or white blood cells. Wound healing is also delayed when corticosteroids are administered. This is due to the anti-inflammatory effect of corticosteroids. And of course, wound healing is also delayed in cases of uncontrolled diabetes because the diabetics are prone to develop infections. Coming to local factors which influence healing, the first thing is the healing depends upon the type, size and location of the wound. It is this type, size and location which determines whether healing takes place by regeneration or repair. Healing is also affected by status of mobility and this is especially important in fracture healing. Vascularity or proper blood supply is also essential for healing. For example, scalp wounds heal better because scalp has a very rich blood supply. And as I already mentioned, infection or presence of foreign body in the wound also delays wound healing. With this, we will wind up our series on healing and repair. We will meet soon in some other topic. Notes as usual are available for download in the description and you can mail me if you need any further help. Until we meet in another series, thanks for watching. Bye.